At Staples Business Advantage, nothing can top the smarts and instincts of the thousands of experts on our team. While AI excels at processing data, automating tasks, and providing insights for better decision making. And when they're used together, they're they are far, far more, more powerful, powerful than, than either, either is, is alone. alone. Whoa. Whoa. I've never felt more alive. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make business easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Stocks for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. I don't think romance has really gone out of it, but I do know in the days of stock certificates, usually the fancier stock certificates had a tendency to be the bigger scams. I have one certificate, it must be two feet by three feet, and it was a gold mining company, and it had gold nuggets, large gold nuggets, and little bottles of gold dust, and a mining scene on it. And of course, that turned out to be a, to be a bust. I, I don't know if it was actually a scam or a swindle, but basically they created that fancy certificate to entice people to invest in that stock. Hi, and welcome back to Stocks for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. When and why did the CIA create a venture capital fund? How did a failed stockbroker become a literary giant? Joining me in this episode to delve into stock market history and trivia is financial historian Fred Full III. Hello, Fred. Hello, and thanks for inviting me. This sounds uh, that's great. Sounds fun. Fred Full III is a former financial services executive, stockbroker, and market maker on the options floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange. He was vice president of a San Francisco-based investment management firm and worked as an adjunct professor for the College of Business at California State University, East Bay. He's the publisher of the Wall Street News Network website, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and he's written several investment-related books, including Stock Market Trivia and Investment Trivia, as well as three mystery novels. So let's go back, and you've got a long history in the stock market, and Mm -hmm. I guess you would have been around in the days of open outcry trading. Do you have any memories of those days and what it was like compared to what it's like now? Oh, yes, I do. And, you know, I started out actually as a stockbroker right out of college. And in those days, you basically had to call up your broker if you wanted to do a trade. Internet back then, and if you needed to make a trade, you have to call your broker and say, I want to buy or sell 100 shares or something. There's no such thing as an online trading platform. So after working as a stockbroker for a few years, I had the opportunity to do trading on the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange on the options floor. And it was actually the second largest options trading floor in the United States after the Chicago Board of Options. And it's just like you see on TV with people yelling and screaming and about the only really major unusual thing I remember is I saw some guy, he was, his face turned white and he's about to faint. He was standing right next to me. And I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, he said, but I just lost a hundred thousand dollars. I'm surprised he wasn't carried out to, uh, to the hospital, (laughs) but, uh, it, it was, you know, fun and a good learning experience. And I, you know, made some money and had the opportunity to oversee the financial planning department of a, of an investment management company. And so I shifted over to there and then I started teaching part-time at the university. And so anyway, it's it's been a nice journey. It's funny to reflect that um, there used to be a, a number of stock exchanges and options exchange trading floors around the country. They weren't, it wasn't all just focused in Wall Street like it is now. That's right. There was a stock exchange in Philadelphia, which, by the way, is the first stock exchange in the United States before even the New York Stock Exchange. There's one in Boston. West of the Mississippi River was basically the Pacific Stock Exchange. Chicago had its a lot of commodities exchanges. And as I mentioned earlier, it also had the Chicago Board of Options, where they just traded options and not stocks. And it was all paper-based in those days as well. I I recall uh, interviewing a guest who was around for the 87 crash, 
And the hardest part of it was actually finalising all the trades on pieces of paper all through the night after the day of the 87 crash. That's right. When I was on the exchange, the way it would work is we had little cards with NCR pages. And for those that don't know, they're like carbon paper, but without the carbon. And there were like three sets of of pages. And so the top one, I would write out, you know, whatever my trade was that I thought. And then the person that I did the trade with, hopefully write out the exact same thing. We would tear off that top page. We'd turn it into the man behind the, the counter. He would take them together, check to make sure they both matched. And then we would keep a copy, and I believe that our sponsoring brokerage firms would get the final card. And then they would run that through a mainframe computer at night. And then the following day, we'd have these big, wide printouts, and we'd have to go over those and make sure that those seemed to match. And, you know, it seemed like every week there was some kind of error, and we'd have to go back and track those and get those corrected. It's not like today, nothing like today. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, um, I also remember speaking to another guy and he worked on a trading floor in the 80s when they first got the first computers. There was actually three brokers to a table and with one monitor, which was on a Lazy Susan, which they would spin around so they could mm-hmm. look at it at different times. And of course, that Lazy Susan had ashtrays in it in those days. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was a stockbroker, we did have a, a quote machine on a Lazy Susan and we we had like a, a bullpen where there would be four brokers in cubicles that had walls about three feet high. And whenever someone needed a quote, they just turn that little quote machine to them, type it in, and they'd get their information. So it's amazing what we have today with computers and the internet. So what was it about the history of financial markets that you found it interesting? Are you, have you always been interested in um, this side of history? Yes, I have. Well, actually, when I became a stockbroker, I did. Part of the reason it happened was a lot of times someone would come in. Oh, by the way, back in those days, people would use stock certificates quite a bit. And so they they would bring in their certificates if they wanted to sell. And sometimes they'd have certificates from totally worthless companies, companies that went bankrupt or went out of business. And they needed to establish a tax loss for tax purposes. And so I would tell our trader, the guy who handles all the trades for all the stockbrokers, I'd say, somebody wants to sell their certificate, I'd be willing to pay a dollar for all their shares and that, and if I could keep that certificate. And so I ended up getting a few of these certificates and started collecting them. And then I found a few other collectors on, you know, through the newspapers, actually through the Wall Street Journal and started buying some old stock certificates. And so over the years, I've been collecting things. And I actually have a an Edison stock ticker that I bought at auction. It's the old, had the glass dome with the internal works inside and printed out the ticker tapes. I've got one of those. And I've saved a few sets of pink sheets. And I don't know if your listeners know what pink sheets are. If they've heard of pink sheet stocks, they're basically usually low price penny stocks that are not traded on a major stock exchange. And in the old days, these pink sheets, they were actually pieces of paper about six inches wide and two feet long and about an inch thick. And on every page, it would be from A to Z, all these pink sheet stocks and the market makers, those were the companies that were willing to buy and sell the stocks and their phone numbers and their current bid and ask prices. And if you wanted to do a trade, the trader would look down that list, try to find the best offer or best bid for that stock. And they'd call up that market maker and do the transaction. And so I've saved some sets of those and I have a pretty extensive set of antique stock certificates now. And I also have another business where I, at antiquestocks.com, where I sell uh, some of these uh, antique stocks, mostly through eBay, but sometimes uh, directly. So that Edison machine, is that like the one Gomez Adams used to use in the TV show, The Adams Family? Yes, it is. Just like that. <laughs> With the ticker tape coming out. <laughs> I don't, I don't oh, that's think amazing. I have any... Yeah, I don't think I have any ticker tape to go with it. There may be a little bit on a spooler inside, but that's about it. 
So it it kind of speaks to the day's antique stock certificates. I'm assuming part of the reason why they were so elaborate was because of anti-counterfeit arrangements, but it's a reminder of the time that banks had neoclassical buildings depicting strength and solidity. Uh, Is it like that, and has romance gone out of finance, if it ever existed? I don't think romance has has really gone out of it, but I do know in the days of stock certificates, usually the fancier stock certificates had a tendency to be the bigger scams. I have one certificate. It must be two feet by three feet, and it was a gold mining company, and it had gold nuggets, large gold nuggets, and little bottles of gold dust, and a mining scene on it. And of course, that turned out to be a, to be a bust. I, I don't know if it was actually a scam or a swindle, but basically they created that fancy certificate to entice people to invest in that stock. And I have another certificate where it shows this unusual machine and a man sitting next to it. And I, I forgot the name of it right off the top of my head, but it was to make a perpetual motion machine. It was a nice, fancy certificate. And of course, that did turn out to be a a total swindle. So (laughs) it's a bit like the ads you see on uh, social media these days for crypto and um, other sorts of scam like activities. Not I'm saying that Bitcoin's a scam, but uh, there are some investments that are more highly speculative than others. Yes. Yeah. For example, FTX was the big Bitcoin and crypto scandal recently with it had a lot of celebrities endorsing them. As a matter of fact, that reminds me, I have a Planet Hollywood certificate with the signatures of Arnold Schwarzenegger and a few other actors uh, had their autographs machine printed on the certificate. And it's a bright multicolor certificate with a picture of the restaurant. And of course, that went bankrupt. So so there might, maybe there was a school of qualitative analysis based on the size and elaborate design of a stock certificate. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should do a study on that one of these days. With Staples Business Advantage, you get the benefit of thousands of experts. Plus optimizations powered by the latest technological innovations. One plus one equals two. Three. Whatever. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. There's a million ways to invest in stocks, but by following a few simple rules, you can avoid many common investment traps and unwanted anxiety. What if you were able to follow seven principles and seven monthly stock picks on your own terms? Seven Investing might be for you. They want to invest for the long haul in great companies with great leaders who can compound capital for years. Seven Investing are pleased to offer listeners of this podcast a free trial for a week and 33% off the annual price if you sign up using the promo code stocks for beginners this is solid research from experienced advisors who live and breathe the markets go to seveninvesting.com that's the number seven investing and use the promo code stocks for beginners to get your absolutely free trial and 33 percent discount on the annual premium plan past performance is not a guarantee of future returns i receive a small commission for services i recommend and i only recommend services i use myself So let's talk about some of the topics you cover in your book, Investment Trivia. And I don't really have any questions lined up here, but it's just more a list of bullet points about some of the topics that you cover. And please feel free to talk about any others, but tell us about the venture capital fund that the CIA created. (laughs) What were they doing? What were they thinking? (laughs) Okay. Well, back in 1999, the CIA chartered a company called InQtel. And this company was designed to fund various companies that would provide technology security because they were always looking for ways to, you know, the CIA is looking for ways to protect the U.S. government in terms of technology in various ways, whether it's to run a missile system or whether it's to protect uh, computers and servers, that type of thing. So there's a couple interesting things about this story. First of all, the company name, InQtel, N-I-N-Q-T-E-L. Well, first of all, the N and the Tel stands for intelligence or Intel. 
But the cue, your listeners will probably find this of interest, comes from the cue on the James Bond movies, the man who came up with all the inventions for James Bond. So they inserted that cue into the name. And the company has founded a lot of different companies, over a hundred of them. One of them was called uh, Keyhole, which eventually became Google Earth. That was one of their companies. It also has funded uh, a company called Palantir, which is involved in technology security. And I think in the interest of full disclosure, I do need to mention I am a shareholder of Palantir, but many, many other companies, a lot of them you'd never hear of. A lot of them are still privately held. As a matter of fact, almost all of them are still privately held. They aren't publicly traded. But it's kind of an interesting thing that the Central Intelligence Agency would be involved in something like this. So they were pioneers of cybersecurity then? That's right. They were. Well, <laughs> I thought it'd be a much more nefarious story than that, but uh, I guess we've got to, them to thank for a lot of the innovations in that area. Yeah, they keep a lot of their information secret about a lot of their companies and what they're working on. You know, obviously a few of them they can let the public know, for example, about Google Earth, but most of the information they keep is confidential. So what about the stock that was run by the FBI and that had a box of clothes <laughs> clothes as its only asset? <laughs> okay. Well, that's another interesting one. And back in 2006, there was a company that was created. It was a penny stock, and it went through a couple of name changes. It ended up with the name Ammo Gear, and it was involved in a pump and dump scheme. I think your listeners know what the, that is, but for the few that don't, it's where a group of people are able to get hold of a large number of shares of a company, and then they send out mass emails and do mass advertising. And sometimes it's not even accurate information that they provide in order to drive the stock price up. And then they dump the stock on unwitting um, investors. Anyway, so the FBI got wind of this company and they actually became the, the well, the managers of the company and working with these penny stock pump and dumpers. And the stock's only asset was just a box of clothes sitting on the corner of a desk. So the company, the corporation itself did not even own the desk wasn't even leasing the office or didn't own the office building that it was located in. It, that's the only asset of the company. And eventually the company dropped from, uh, on a split adjusted basis, about $4,000 a share to $0.10 cents a share. Now, I'm not sure if your listeners know what split adjustment means, but when a stock has a reverse split, in order to adjust for that price, to get comparison of the current price, you have to kind of back into it and it makes it a much higher and higher price. Did you want me to go through an example of that or, or not? Yes, please. I think that's, that's great. It's uh, very educational to know how capital is allocated within a company. Okay. Well, suppose someone owns a hundred shares of a company and the stock sells for a dollar a share and the company has a one for 10 reverse split. Now, I should mention most companies, when they split a stock, they, you end up with more shares. You know, they'll have a two for one or three for one. But when you have a reverse split, you end up with less shares. Now, technically, right after the split, your total amount invested should be about the same that you had prior to the split. So using my example, 100 shares at a dollar a share, you have a one for 10 reverse split, which means you end up with 10 shares that are now trading at $10 a share. Now, imagine if you had a, a one for 100 reverse split, you end up with one share because you only had 100 shares, you end up with one share, which is trading at $100. Now, a lot of times when companies do this, we could go back to the 10 for one because it's more likely that that's the scenario 
well, that $10 could drop back down to another dollar a share. So then they have another one for 10 reverse split. And now instead of their 10 shares, they only have one share and it's only worth $10. So you can see in order to get comparison of what you actually started with or what the original starting price is, it creates this really high base price. And anyway, so the stock ended up being about 10 cents a share. And after the pump and dumpers were arrested, the company went out of business. And how did the box of clothes appear on the balance sheet? As an asset, just as there, I think it was a $50 <laughs> value or something like that. Oh, I'm glad it's not a liability. So they were, they were clean <laughs> clothes, were they? <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, it had no liabilities. So <laughs> actually in pretty good shape, all things considered. <laughs> So it was basically for the FBI to facilitate an investigation into these kind of schemes. Yeah, it was basically a sting operation. Oh, nice to hear. And and that's something that uh, as well is a a warning for listeners just to be very careful about any anything that anyone is trying to sell to you as being too good to be true with a huge stock certificate. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> or if a company has a a reverse split, I would be awfully cautious about that. I can't think of any company off the top of my head where it's had a reverse split and then the company eventually turns out to be successful. Mm. So tell us about Bitcoin trivia. Okay. Well, in terms of Bitcoin, the biggest bit of trivia about Bitcoin is that the original Bitcoin transaction was for two pizzas. And this was back in the days of hobbyists when Bitcoin, I believe, was trading for about two tenths of one cent, one U.S. cent. And some guy posted on a an online bulletin board. He said, well, I've got 10,000 Bitcoin and I'd like to trade that for two pizzas if you deliver them to me. And another hobbyist saw that and thought, well, this will be fun. You know, I'll get this new thing called Bitcoin and all it's going to cost me is a couple of pizzas and be interesting to see how this thing goes through. So the seller of the Bitcoin, buyer of the pizzas, he went out and bought the two pizzas through the Papa John's is one of the popular pizza chains in the United States. And he bought two pizzas from them, delivered them to the man's house. They were both living in Silicon Valley. And the man then that had the Bitcoin, he transferred the Bitcoin to the man that had the pizzas. And now if that man had actually, the man that originally had the 10,000, or for that matter, the man that received the 10,000 Bitcoin had kept on holding onto that Bitcoin, it would now be, I believe, based on recent prices around $600 million, something like that. I'd have to look up the exact price, but it was some outrageously high price where you'd be close to a, oh, it wasn't that high. It was only, they would have had about $291 million. So that's all they would have had. (laughs) They had held on. (laughs) Yeah, I have actually heard a story about someone who bought an ice cream at Glastonbury, the music festival in England, and um, they paid for it with one, Bitcoin, or they they worked out how to buy a Bitcoin to pay for it. And the the transaction didn't go through and forgot about it for years. And then that Bitcoin at the time uh, had become valuable enough to buy a car. (laughs) And again, of course, (laughs) if he'd kept on, held on to it for a lot longer, most probably worth a lot more than that. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Yeah. And then over the years, I've heard, heard of stories of people that have saved their Bitcoin on their hard drive of their laptop and the laptop is old and they eventually discard it or they I heard of one man who threw out his his hard drive threw it in the trash and then realized his bitcoin was on there and so he went to the dump to look for it and I think he eventually found it It was able to retrieve his bitcoin (laughs) a desperate move (laughs) yes So tell us about the first women-owned stock brokerage firm back in 1870. Okay. Well, this is kind of an interesting story. There was a woman named Victoria Claflin, and she had a sister whose first name was Tennessee. 
and they were originally involved in spiritualism and fortune telling and that type of thing. But then they decided the real money is in investing. And they actually opened up the first woman owned stock brokerage firm in New York City in 1870. And the Wall Street Journal reported that on the day they opened, men were lined up around the block to go in and give them their business. And apparently they were able to provide a lot of good information that allowed a lot of these investors to make money. Part of the reason was because they were friends with Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was one of the railroad barons and multimillionaires back in those days. And they became very successful at it and did that for quite a while. One of the interesting things about the connection with Cornelius Vanderbilt was that Victoria Claflin's sister would go to visit him once a week at his house and provide some sort of treatment service for him. Now, I don't know what kind of treatment service she provided. It was supposed to be some kind of medical service. And in return, he would provide her with a lot of good stock tips. And that's the story of the uh, Claflin <laughs> sisters and the first uh, women-owned stock brokerage firm. Uh, I was just wondering if there were many barriers to entry for women to get into a business like that in the 1870s. Well, I think for them, they didn't have to worry about barriers. As a matter of fact, she was, uh, Victoria Claflin, was actually the first presidential candidate. And the funny thing was, she couldn't have been a president even if she had won because she wasn't 35 years old. And there's a law in the United States that you have to be at least 35 years old in order to be president of the United States. So she had an interesting background. <laughs> so Jules Verne started out as a stockbroker and actually failed at that before becoming a famous author. That's right. Yeah, there's actually quite a few famous people that started out as stockbrokers. And as you mentioned, Jules Verne, did try to be a, um, a broker and wasn't very successful at it. So he started writing books and became famous as an author. Some of the other people who are, I guess you would call them celebrities who started out uh, as stockbrokers include, there's Bill W. He's the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so he doesn't, I, I understand that they don't use their last names and that's why he goes by the name Bill W. Florence Chadwick, I don't know if many people know who she is, but I believe she was one of the first women, if not the first, to swim the English Channel. And from Los Angeles to Catalina, uh, she was a famous Olympic swimmer. And she eventually became a stockbroker down in San Diego. And I believe I actually met her once uh, before she finally retired. Brian Dennehy, who's a famous actor, also started out as a stockbroker. For those of you that ever watched the Leave it to Beaver TV show from many years ago, there was a character on there named Lumpy Rutherford, and his real name was Frank Bank, and he actually became a bond broker in Los Angeles. And then, of course, Martha Stewart, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about Martha Stewart. She actually started out as a stockbroker. <laughs> A lot of crossover between entertainment and the finance industry. That's right. And I have heard of this next one, the Skirt Length Index, but I can't remember the details of it. What, what is the Skirt Length Index? Okay, that's a kind of a fun one. And the Skirt Length Index basically says if the hems of women's skirts are low, close to the ground, then it means the stock market's going to go down. If the hem of the skirts goes up, and the higher up it goes, the more likely that the stock market is going to, to go up. And so back in the 1920s, well, prior to the 1920s, women wore very long skirts down to the floor. But during the Roaring Twenties, when we had the flappers, the, the skirt length went up to knee length, and that's when the stock market started to really take off in the, the roaring 20s. And then around 1928, 1929, the skirt length started to drop again. And of course, we had the crash in 1929. 
and then skirts stayed below the knees for a long time through the 50s. And then around the 60s, it went from calf length to above the knees. And at that time, the skirt lengths were moving you know, way up and the stock market was moving up with it. And then in the 70s, we went back to the midi dresses and the ankle length dresses. And then the mar- stock market crashed in the 1973-74 era. And then since that time, the lengths have moved back up, but then they've moved down and now they seem to be all over the place. So I don't think we can really tell anything these days from skirt lengths anymore. But historically, it's <laughs> kind of- They're as confused as the market is. <laughs> That's right. Historically, it's kind of interesting to look <laughs> at that. But these days, it, you, you can't really tell because the links are all over. Investing in shares can be fun, but the paperwork isn't. My investing's been transformed since using ShareSite, the best portfolio tracking tool for investing. My portfolios are on ShareSite, and whenever I buy or sell, the trades are automatically recorded. I can see the dividends I'm receiving, and it helps me to work out my asset allocation. ShareSite are extending a special offer to listeners of this podcast, four months free on an annual premium plan. There's a seven-day free trial where you can experience the full power of ShareSite portfolio management. Go to ShareSite.com slash Stocks for Beginners and sign up now for a free trial before taking advantage of four free months. That's ShareSite.com slash Stocks for Beginners. So my next bullet point is the first marijuana stock. And I'm assuming this is not a recent thing, (laughs) that it most probably goes back to the days when there are a lot of what are now prohibited drugs in um, many mainstream products. That's right. Yes, this actually, this company was selling uh, THC, which is the primary ingredient in marijuana, tetrahydrocannabinol, back in 1985. And the company was Unimed Pharmaceuticals. And it was sold as an appetite stimulant and antiemetic to prevent throwing up. And they sold it for many years. The company was eventually taken over by Solve, which is a, I believe it's a Belgian company, and which is still publicly traded, although I don't think it's really traded here in the United States. Maybe over the counter it is. And that was actually the the first seller of a marijuana extract. And a lot of people didn't even know that this company was even around or that it even did this. Of course, these days in the United States, marijuana is legal in more than half the states, even recreationally. And uh, this kind of leads to something else. The, The first medical marijuana company publicly traded is a company called Medical Marijuana Incorporated. And that company has an interesting bit of trivia. That company's stock certificates were actually made with marijuana, actually made with hemp, and hemp comes from the marijuana plant. And every time, whenever I give a presentation to people and I mention this company's stock certificate, they say, well, can you roll it up and roll up the stock certificate and then smoke it? (laughs) And and I'd say, well, yeah, but then you'd lose the certificate. (laughs) But I think they had so much of a demand. That's a good for idea, though, for a. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a good idea for a company, though, is to um, make stock certificate rolling papers for joints. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I, I think the demand was there you so go. There's big. a business idea straight for you. <laughs> yeah. The. So um, I don't think you mentioned the year of that those companies when they were, were trading. Oh, well, the Unimed, when they started selling THC, was back in 1985. Medical marijuana was just about the time that it was legalized in California, which was several years ago. I don't remember the exact year. And since then, they've legalized recreational marijuana in California. But for those of you that want to get that stock certificate from Medical Marijuana Incorporated, they unfortunately, they no longer issue that certificate. I think too many people were just, you know, buying a few shares just to have it and maybe spoke it one of these days. 
that's a good story. Uh-huh. So, Fred, you've got a long history of experience in the stock market and investing. Mm-hmm. Someone who's listening to the podcast who's becoming interested in investing for the first time, what's one piece of advice that you'd like to share with them? Well, I believe in the barbell theory of investing. And for those listeners that aren't familiar with it, it's where you have some really conservative investments that you invest for the long term. And then you have the other half where you do your trading, you invest in the speculative items and that type of thing. And I've been doing that for many years and it's worked out well. The only thing you have to keep in mind is your long-term investments, they're better off kept in a separate uh, um, a separate portfolio or separate account. And I try not to even look at those investments and try not to put your long-term investments in your trading account. I've made that mistake a couple of times and then you look at it as a trade and you see it go down a little and it stresses you out because it's dragging down your trading portfolio. You just have to, whatever you're investing in for the long term, you really need to keep that separate, you know, forget it even exists and then do all your speculation in your speculation account. You mentioned 50-50, but Often people think of the barbell approach as possibly being more like an 80-20, 70-30 kind of arrangement as well. Depends on your risk tolerance and you know how much risk you're willing to take. It may depend on how much money you do you have to invest. If you have, you know, ten thousand dollars versus one thousand dollars versus a hundred thousand dollars, you know, it could be a little bit different. For me personally, and I'm not saying this is a recommendation, but I'd say maybe 10% is speculative and the rest is long-term. But when I was much younger, it was more like 50-50. And when you're real young, if you lose half your money in the speculation, then you know you still have many years to build that back up. So I would strongly recommend that you kind of look at what risk you want to take, how much money you're willing to risk, and if you're young, you know, try 50-50. If it stresses you out at night, then cut it down to 30% of your total portfolio or 10%. So tell us about the Wall Street News Network, Antique Stock Certificates, and all of your activities so listeners okay. can find out more about you. Okay. Well, Wall Street News Network is a website that I started many years ago. Actually, it had a different name when I first started. It was called stalker blog and it's kind of a play on the word of stalker somebody who stalks stocks st yeah (laughs) stocking stocks anyway i eventually changed the name to wall street news network and have been doing it for many years and basically what i try to do is i try to come up with more narrower industries and what stocks are participants in those industries whether it's companies that make chocolate or companies that are in the wine industry or artificial intelligence, you know, what are the pure plays in those various types of industries? I don't make any recommendations. I just try to provide information on the stocks that are available and give enough information to kind of get the reader started on doing their own research and determine on their own whether they want to go into any or all of those stocks. And I also, every month, include stocks that are going ex-dividend. So some investors like to do the buying dividend game, where if the stock drops enough prior to the ex-dividend date, they buy the stock. And then as the stock approaches the ex-dividend date, it tends to go back up. And then, of course, on the ex-dividend date, all things being equal, the stock does drop by the amount of the dividend, but hopefully it hasn't dropped more than the purchase price. So they're able to collect that dividend, sell the stock, and basically be out of that stock. So they're out of their risk, but collect the dividend. So that's basically, oh, by the way, it's a free site. Oh, I do put out a newsletter twice a month. There's no charge to go on the site. You don't even have to log in if you don't want. But I strongly recommend that if you do go on the site, please sign up for the free newsletter. There's no charge at all. 
It's a once a month thing. I don't run any ads on the newsletter and it has links to various articles in the site and, and so forth. And from my little bit of research about you and reading the blog, there's some very interesting and valuable information there, which you're providing absolutely free. That's right. No cost at all. No need to even log into the site. And it's all, all there for you. <laughs> A public service announcement for the finance industry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my website is antiquestocks.com. It's the quickest way to get there. And it has a a little bit of basic information. And if you have any stocks that, you know, maybe you inherited and you want to find out if they have collectible value, then I'll, I can let you know, you know, at no charge, you know, if there is a collectible value and if I have any interest in buying them. If you want me to actually research the stock certificate to see if there's any trading or redemption value, there is a fee for that. But other than that, if you just want to know if it's collectible or not, I can let you know. Fantastic. Fred Fuld. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed being here. Thanks for listening to Stocks for Beginners. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes, only algorithms. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make furnishing an office space easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.